Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. This is uh, uh, week 48. This is the next uh, edition of uh, uh, IMO Vlog. And today we, our topic is Pop Psychology, Dr. Phil and Oprah. And it may seem to be a deviation from our, our original topics, which were, were, was slut shaming and, um, and then we did uh, tween, and, uh, tween and teen girls. Uh, looking at the the sort of I guess you will the reality versus rhetoric of girls and we started going into that and I noticed that we haven't really finished these topics and I say well why are we going over here for now you know why are we going over here now why not just sort of continue along the you know along the way but in many ways this is going along the way because there are this is a, a a component that is related to girls in other words this whole series. Uh, the IMO vlog is me focused primarily on girls, uh, and uh, who call female behavior, and it's being it's it's aimed in this way specifically because IMO from uh, Awesomeness TV came out of the beauty guru, came out of the beauty guru community, and if you want to improve the world, if you want to really sort of push the boundaries, then you need to take people from where they are, and wherever they are into new places, into sort of breaking the boundaries uh, and breaking the barriers. And this is one of the ways of doing this. Uh, most girls, uh, although they are intelligent, will not break the boundaries. They will stay well within the textbook. And that means when they go into psychology, more often than not, they will uh, uh, stay well within uh, called textbook psychology. And uh, inside textbook psychology, psychology, this is where you get uh, Dr. Phil and Oprah. And they are the creators of pop psychology, popular psychology. And it's psychology for entertainment purposes. It's in other words, it's sort of like an old magic show. And instead of hypnotizing a person, you're ooh, fixing their problems and dealing with their issues. And it's entertainment. This is you're you're, you're basically uh, using other people's uh, serious mental health issues as your entertainment. And you can decide for yourself whether this is sick and wrong, and uh, you know whether it's moral or not moral. Uh, but otherwise, <laughs> uh, you know, it is part of the series. Uh, the, these series are part of the Insta vlogs here. These, these are research notes. Uh, we are going to be going in this whole series, the whole Insta vlog series, is about going beyond the textbook, going into research. It is because it's part of my research. It's part of it is not part of a textbook study, and it's a because girls do tend to be textbook oriented, I do want to break those barriers. I do want to break those bounds because there's a lot of information that they need to know. A lot of what happens to them in society, in the world, the way things are, and one of the narratives I was just sort of reading about looking up on feminism because the next series, the uh, next edition is going to talk about feminism. And the article was talking about, they were showing a picture of girls in bikinis and Asked himself, and they were asking the question, "How did we get here through? I think it was uh, you know, thirty or forty years of how did we go from the suffragettes uh, in the Victorian era, for, from women li living back in the eighteen hundreds, uh, to you know, which was fighting for, for for female equality? All of a sudden, now women are more objectified than they've ever been before in history. Uh, they are properties; they're sold as property. Uh, and." You see this in uh, educational film after educational film, films that supposedly have a narrative to them, uh, a moral narrative to them that this is wrong and so on and so forth. That a lot of you know the way uh, guys treat girls is wrong, and yet 
what happens is none of it gets better, it gets worse. And this is where we look at these issues, this is where we peel back the layers and begin our research into seeing what's going on. Why do, why do we see all this stuff here? And it's important for girls to understand this. It's important to understand that there is a beyond the text, but there are questions that need to be answered for them. But they're not in the textbook. And they're, they're there because they're not wanted to be in the, They're not supposed to be in the textbook. That there is hidden information, and then there's public information. That there are two sides to things. And that more often than not, the things that girls need to be aware of are actually in hidden information and not in public information. And this is where we get into uh, the whole situation of pop psychology because there is a hidden side to pop psychology that very few people are aware of that affects how pop psychology emerged and how it sort of evolves. And then why it also involves a lot of, uh, you know, you know, in many cases, it involves girls. <laughs> You know, girls are are are, are a particular uh, uh, topic here because you know uh, there is a lot to be said about them. There is a lot to do with them, and they are the target of a lot of unfair things. And let's be frank about this. Is then this is we'll talk we'll talk a bit more about rape, and this is something that uh, Ge the geeky blonde uh, talked about. This is there are several other. Uh, YouTubers we talk about, we will be getting into these in, in, in a more in-depth theory. This is going bad to slut shaming and everything like that. And that there's a fundamental mistake in here, and that psychology really lets people down because the psychology in the textbook is not the real psychology. There is actually in psychology that is used by the governments, and a lot of governments use this psychology, to change and manipulate the situation that's going on so it's the so that society is the way the politicians want them. In other words, there is a sense of control, a, a form of psychological manipulation that's going on that changes how people understand things. It is not necessary that these people come to an understanding, the, 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 vic, the victims, but the, uh, let's call them victims anyways, the general public, public's understanding. You may have very intelligent people being manipulated in ways that they don't necessarily understand they're being manipulated. And this is where you need to start looking at independent knowledge. Most girls, when you look at them, they talk about their influences and so on and so forth. They talk about role models. Girls are very heavily involved into role models, that, that people need to be a certain role model for a particular person. Well, the reason why I'm against having role models, so not because I don't think, oh, that person is not nice. It's not an issue of being nice or whatever. It's an issue that you need to understand stuff for yourself. You need to ask questions, and being questions is asking questions is not being mean. It's not about being mean. It's not hating people. It's about developing an understanding of what's actually going on in the situation around you. And this way, you can make a better choice as to you know how you're going to do things. And the thing is, from pop, the pop psychology standpoint, from the in the hidden, not really pop psychology, but from the hidden standpoint. There is a view that girls can't handle the stuff in one level. Two, they don't want girls to understand what's actually going on. So they feel feed them a false narrative and send them in a false direction. In other words, a lot of the people controlling societies, society, and a lot of them are men, have these behaviors that are very predatory. They want and need girls for them to use. And they believe they have a right to use these people. And so you're not going to go out there and inform them, hey, you're being used. What you're going to go out and you're going to go out and try to change the narrative and try to create this psychology that tells everybody, what you're doing is fine and normal. Don't worry about it. We'll handle it. We'll handle everything. You're all right. You're, all right. you're safe. This is what's really going on here. And they'll give you a false narrative. They'll give you a false story. And this is what pop psychology... Pop psychology is a false psychology. It's a pseudo psychology. That gets a person believing, and this is even up to, up to the PhD level. And then what I'm saying is that the option to move off textbook begins in the second year of university. And I said it's an option, it's not the standard path. People do, to a certain degree, go off these sort of the standard textbook thing, but. It doesn't really lead them into independent thought. It doesn't lead them into independent thinking. 
they think it does, but in many cases they're being manipulated by other people who are sort of creating the image, creating the background, so they can drive them in a direction that they want, that the, the person who's manipulating the situation wants the student to go in. And a lot of times it's basically misogynistic, it's, it's uh, egocentric, it's there to uh, promote the person's own ego. So when we come back, we'll go into we'll go further into pop psychology. We'll look at in at the origins of psychology and then how pop psychology emerges from it. All right. See you in the next segment. <laughs> Prepared to have what you know challenged by Simon Alpha TV Network. Alrighty, welcome back, everybody. It's time for the next segment of uh, the uh, the in my IMO vlog. I almost got my vlogs mixed up for a minute there because there's a number of them. There's not just one. And we're talking about the pop, psych pop psychology, Dr. Phil and Oprah. These are the two primary icons of pop psychology. And a lot of what they do is actually fake psychology. It's not real psychology. Uh, because most people don't understand what real psychology is. Even the psychologists themselves will say, Well, Dr. Phil, he's a doctor. See, he's got a doctor in front of his name. He knows psychology because he's a psychologist. Well, no, because there's a false narrative in psychology. And this false narrative continues all the way up to the levels of psychologists. A lot of psychologists don't necessarily understand what's going on because there were two, connect there were two parts of psychology. Just the way in physics, there's two, you know, two roots of science. There's a public route for science and then there's a hidden route for science the hidden route for science well what where is it where you know how you, well this is a conspiracy theory well no all you have to do is look at the development of the atomic bomb and understand that uh, the military has its own purposes its own needs and when it creates its science it's done specifically for that and the thing is a lot of these these if you look who where the department of defense gets its scientists from well, go look at the university funding, the funding. Look at the research funding. You'll find a lot of uh, programs, a lot of research being funded by DARPA. DARPA is part of the Department of Defense, and so you'll find a lot of research, including psychology, being funded and supported by the, the Department of Defense. In other words, you have uh, you have a public track that's that is designed for the public, and you have a private track or a secret track. That's designed for the government and designed for military understanding. Uh, and for, obviously, military use at some point in time later on. And this includes PSYOPs. This is psychological operations. This, this is uh, part of clandestine or cold warfare. Cold warfare, this talk, this starts back in the Soviet Union, talks about, uh, when you talk about going from the hot war of World War II into the cold war of World War III. World War Three was the Cold War between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, and it was a covert war. And a lot of the psychology was really developed through there, even though it was worked. They started working on from way back when. Uh, from actually, they started from. The, it really began. The big stuff comes so out. Start really starts coming out as an official program in nineteen thirties, uh, but you know it comes out from this sort of uh, these dark basements into, you know, into more of a mainstream uh, laboratory setting, which are basically funded by the military, but again, secret. And you would have the public face of the mental institute, or, the psycho or the, of the psychological institute, or the, you know, psychi psychiatric institute. These are the different places that you can find them. You would have a public aspect, and then you would have a hidden secret aspect. There were, so there were part for the public and there was part for the military. Two different parts, but to, to together they use the public face to hide the hidden face. And this actually can be seen in the origins of psychology. Go back to Freud and ask, well, who is the one uh, who developed the secret, uh, the, the secret psychology? And it's actually Freud's nephew, uh, Edward Bernays. And he's the one who took the basic work of, uh, of Freud uh, his uncle, 
And took the understanding is in there and created a way to start manipulating people, start manipulate society, so that instead of using open warfare, using hot war, using guns to control people, you could use uh, psychological manipulation, PR, and propaganda to control people. And the thing is, is that while they presented this as something new, it really wasn't something new. If you look at Freud's work, Freud's work is not new. You can actually find a lot of the Freudian concepts and ideas about uh, how the mind works. And, and, and this is a bizarre part of psychology. This is why psychology itself, from Freud on, is really a pseudoscience, not a real science. Uh, they were atheists. And a lot of times they'll say, oh yes, they're atheists. Right? We don't believe in God. There is no God. We can prove there's no God. And then you'll find a lot of people in cognitive sciences and so on and so forth uh, working to prove there is no God. Well, they have a slight problem. Uh, because if there's no God, then all of their science work, their, all the research, all the intellectual work is wiped out. Because intellect is actually a function of the soul, it's a function of the mind, and it's not a function of the physical brain. They've been trying to prove this for years now, but have never, they haven't actually found thought within the brain. There is no chemical mechanism for thought. And this was demonstrated when, they, when, when you have uh, twins um, who are from the same egg, and I, got, uh, I should have written down which was which with the you know fraternal or maternal. Uh, and at this late hour, I'm filming this at four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. Uh, my mind isn't necessarily there to remember things. So uh, when they looked at the identical twins who basically have the same DNA and said, okay, these people are funded to clones and found that the, the twins have different behaviors. Well, all of a sudden, the whole argument that behavior is chemically oriented is gone. You have another explanation needed, and so psychology came, is, is still here today. The psychology of the mind is still here today, even though psychology itself, the psychologists, the scientists, have said the soul doesn't exist. And <laughs> again, here's where the contradiction comes in. If the soul doesn't exist, then neither does psychology. Here's the thing. You need to understand that psychology is based on the soul. If the soul doesn't exist as a fundamental, then psychology doesn't exist as a fundamental. And even the terminology is, is, it agrees with it. So you say there's no soul. In Greek, the term soul is sihi. Where do we hear the name sihi? We see it in psychologia. Psychologia is psychology. Psychology is the Greek term for a study of the soul. If there's no soul, then there's no psychiologia. There's no psychology. So psychology is a, from the beginning, a get, the get-go, a pseudo-psychology. And Edward Bernays knows this. He knows that it is a pseudo-science. And therefore, because it's a pseudo-science, it's perfect for this, as a science of manipulation to, to, to manipulate people. And they start using him, his new ideas. He's hired not only by the UN, but it's hired by companies who want to change the narrative in society. And so you have the marches in, um, in these various different parades and so on and so forth in New York. And they were working on this way to uh, get women to start smoking. So you don't go up to women and say, okay, because women at the time, in the Victorian time, didn't smoke. And they wanted to change the narrative, so they wanted the women to start smoking so they could start selling more cigarettes. So what did they do? They went up to a group of uh, suffragists, a group of uh, women activists. And it wasn't a guy who went up to this, it was a woman who did this. They paid a woman to go up to a group of, of other women in these activists and start saying, passing out the cigarettes and saying, these are the torches of freedom. When you light one up, a cigarette, you're lighting a torch of freedom. This is, it shows that you're breaking the barriers. You're, you're doing what a man would do. This is equality. And so they, these women, sponsored by the tobacco company, walk down the street lighting their torches of freedom in the parade. This was women, feminists, this ideologists, being manipulated into selling cigarettes. 
to creating an entire generation of people who will smoke cigarettes simply because they were told to by a company. This is PR. This is marketing. This is the origins of psychology and marketing. And it's also used in psychology, in the psychology of warfare, in the psychology of psyops, psychological operations. That's black ops. That's uh, special operations. You know, special forces, assassinations, cold war, intelligent warfare, uh, covert covert operations, black ops. This is all the core of psyops. This is all uh, hidden psychology, and this is all the creation initially. The, the grandfather of all this is Edward Bernays. It's uh, Freud's nephew. And Freud knew what was going on. He understood what was going on, even at the time, he, up until the time of his death. He never said anything. He was upset about it, but he wasn't. He, was, he had, at that time, point in time, the time he died, Freud was completely disillusioned in, in man, believing that man was an unreasoning being, beast, that men were beasts. And included women in this. You know, that men could not be controlled, that they were a wild herd. Well, Edward Bernays said, took this concept of the wild herd, the book called the bewildered herd, and tried, tried to start finding ways to manipulate this, to create crowd control, or guiding the herd. And you'll see this in, you'll see this in, uh, banking. You look at what's going on in Wall, Wall Street. You, you see everyone. You have a report comes up and says, "Oh, stocks are falling," and then and there's a crisis, and you know people go to start selling their stocks, and they say, "Oh, the stock market is up. You got to go up and start buying stocks." And people run to start buying stocks. Well, that's Edward Bernays. This is the, the psychology of manipulation. There's not a lot. If you look, step back, you actually do the research of what's going on in, in the economy, and uh, I am, I am, I have done this. These stampedes are false. It's the Edward Bernays control of the bewildered herd. It is the herding of a uh, group of people into the direction you want them to go in. It's creating the stampede. And there are hedge funds who pay for this stuff. Because hedge funds, and you're hearing about hedge funds, you hear about George Soros, Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha. These people are all part of the hedge fund group. Hedge funds make their money off of volatility. It's, they don't care whether the market is up or down. They want the market to move up and down. As the market moves up and down, in, you see on Wall Street, they make money. If the, if the market does not move up and down, they don't make money. So they need the psychology of manipulation to start stampeding the herd. Buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. And this is the whole purpose of why you see Bloomberg TV, why you see people watching these uh, economic TV shows that have the stock market ticker going across the ball. They're creating an environment, they're creating a narrative that you are a business person, you are a stock person, you are a bank financier. No, you're a gambler. You're hedging on whether and betting on whether the stock market will go up or down and you're following a narrative that is created and set for you in order to drive you, to manipulate you into buying and selling. This is what most traders are. This is how traders work. There is a mathematics behind this. There is a, a science behind this. But these people aren't working with the science. They're not working with the mathematics. They're being manipulated. They, they're part of the sell in Wall Street. They're part of the sell of the stock market, the capital environment. And they're needed to create this whole thing of uh, 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 the, the volatility you see that's needed so that the hedge funds can make their money. And this is, this, is, this is the origin of psychology. And you can see, this is not the psychology that's in the textbooks. This is not the psychology that you see on Dr. Phil or Oprah. This is the real psychology. This is the psychology that is hidden, that is not seen. And it goes into things like, you mentioned this here, you can research this, look up the term MK Ultra. If you look at the term MK Ultra, you do a search on that term, MK, M as in Mark and K as in Karen, Ultra. Do a search on that and you'll find there's a huge amount of information on it. And you'll start seeing bits and pieces. And not all is true, you've got to be careful. Some of the stuff is true and some of the stuff isn't true. It's just simply taking a look and seeing what's there, looking at the volume of stuff that's there. 
they give you an idea that there is something there, but the actual details, you have to start sifting through the information to start re re getting an understanding of what's real and what's not real. Uh, that there is a hidden world that the public knows nothing about. And that this hidden world involves a lot of psychology. And that the world that we do see, the public world, is a pop psychology. It is a, a fantasy created for us. Anyways, in the next section, we will talk more about Dr. Phil. We'll talk about some of the stuff he does. And some of the way he ends up manipulating his, his, the people there. And we'll talk more also about Oprah and get into how Oprah does their manipulation as well. And see you in the next segment. <laughs> Everybody knows Dr. Phil. Everybody knows Oprah. And we all know Dr. Phil is a doctor of psychology. And he probably presents his credentials every time he gets up there and he's out there, you know, seriously helping people. You know, he's there to help people with their problems. And of course, every week it has a different theme and different particular issue. And we see uh, if you look at the length of time he's been on TV, you look at the number of psychological problems, you look at the number of uh, mental health patients, uh, mentally ill people who are being shot by the police, shot and killed by the police, you realize that things are getting worse and not better. Uh, this includes uh, what we see in uh, the, the uh, I think it's Sandy Hook school shooting that's in Connecticut. Uh, the, pers was the person who did the shooting was under uh, uh, psychiatric treatment at the time. He was on medication. He had severe mental health problems. And we see there's a, a lot of, where there's Columbine, all these different school shootings, there is an element of psychology that's behind it that's not often brought out. And if Dr. Phil was actually doing anything significant, these things wouldn't be happening. He would have, because he's all, he's, you know, he, 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 he talks to everybody around the world because he, his shows were broadcast like that. And if people understood what was going on, it wasn't simply just entertainment, then there would be a solution there. And, but this is where the kind of the false narrative is, and this is where, you know, you have to be careful what you watch on TV and understand that the solution isn't always entirely presented there, that there are things that are not understood. That, that in many cases, when you're watching a television show, particularly if there's a dramatic background music or there, you know, there, there, there is, there is some degree of, uh, of drama there, that a lot of the drama is actually created as a creative narrative. And it's there for entertainment purposes. It's not there really to give you good information. And as I said before, if, if, if you watch this all the way through, uh, there's a hidden psychology there. There's a, there is a psychology of manipulation. A lot of the psychology that that you see on Dr. Phil is presented in the way it is because and this is where you get the term pop psychology because it's, a, it's a psychology designed for public consumption. It's not designed to show you the real psychology that's going how people really behave. It's designed to give you a view, a painted view, a design view of how people behave. In other words, it creates a narrative, it creates an environment that Makes you think one thing is occurring when something else is re when something else is really occurring. In other words, it hides a lot of the truth to what's actually going on behind the scenes. And this is why, in many cases, the results are not that good. You will have people who will leave, and you've actually people leaving these shows. Like uh, uh, this is where what happened to uh, the, uh, the earlier the predecessors of Dr. Phil, like Sally Jesse Raphael, and. I think it was Phil Donahue. You had people being being shot on the show. You had people uh, committing crimes afterwards, and there there is a narrative, uh, a, a a sort of a line that is well known, but it's 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 not out, it's it's sort of a open secret that they bring the people in with limousines and kick them out with taxis. In other words, they draw them in like drug dealers, piling with some more wealth and everything, but the end result is not is not nearly as good as what they were promised. In other words, instead of being rich and famous afterwards, they're simply an oddity, a sideshow, if you will. And then after they leave, 
They go back to what wherever they were, and they don't leave with, on, on on limousines. They leave, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, economy class taxi. They're not leaving with a chauffeur. They're not brought in. They don't leave the way they were brought in. And this is obviously evident with the Dr. Phil show. The, the, if you go back and you go do start doing background research into Dr. Phil, start looking at, you know, are things as rosy as they, they appear on the show, and you start finding problems. You start seeing that one person has this problem, other person has, you know, there are a lot more problems that sort of pop up than are just presented on the show. In other words, the issues are never resolved in the show. Uh, they're not really resolved on the show. And a lot of this is simply entertainment. In other words, we're using other people's pain, other people's problems as our entertainment. And that's what these shows are designed to do. And this is where he brings his money in. And as long as that's kept, then there's no issue. People are saying, okay, this is fine. But the worst not fine is that if you think that there's a solution to a problem, so you are a person who has a particular problem, or, or people think that you've Understand a particular you understand a particular situation, so you plan to make your safety arrangements on this. This is particularly true for girls. So, oh, I'm a I'm a smart individual. I can take care of myself. But what happens is more often than not, when they go to a, a particular situation or a party or whatever it is, and this doesn't necessarily have to be a party, they get into a situation. And if you look at the history of rape, and you start looking at the situations into, into which rape occurs, and this includes uh, the scandals that occurred on uh, YouTube. Most of the victims knew uh, their attackers. They considered them friends. And they, they were, in, in the beginning, they said that they, these people were nice people, and, you know, that there was nothing wrong with them, and, you know, and they felt very much in control. Of their situation, and this is the, this is what you're taught in school. You're taught to be self, uh, you know, self-assertive, to be independent, to be, you know, not to listen to other people. That a lot of this old nerd. Oh, you're gonna be careful, stranger. Oh, oh don't, don't worry about that. I'm smart. I'm an individual. I can take care of myself. Well, what happens? And this is why girls, in many cases, you hear afterwards and you watch the girls on YouTube describe what they went through to a certain degree. And you see that they're angry, they're upset, they're crying. You see the psychological torment that they went through. And the one common point is, I'm so stupid, I should have known better. In other words, the stuff that their parents told them, the old funny daddy stuff that's in school, kind of, oh, papoo, you've got sexual education, you don't really need what your parents are telling you. If they had listened to what their parents had told them, they would have gone into the situation that caused the problem at the beginning. But they didn't. They listened to what they saw on Dr. Phil. They listened to what they saw on Oprah. They felt confident about themselves and then they went out and got themselves into this situation they did not, without understanding what the, real, what the real risks were. They don't understand that on Dr. Phil and, all, and Oprah that a lot of the sex abuse that we see in Hollywood, a lot of the scandals that we see in YouTube are going on behind the scenes on Dr. Phil's show. They're going on behind the scenes on Oprah. It's in their TV networks. It's on every single set. I mean, it's been like that for a long time. But it's hidden. It's part of the hidden psychology that is designed to be hidden. Pop psychology is the stuff we're meant to see, that we're meant to, to give us a false sense of security, a false sense of understanding. And as this sense grows, we start removing our safety guard. We start our safety, our guard, our guard that protects us from 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 physical harm, from psychological harm, starts to get lowered. We start saying, "Oh, well, we're comfortable, we're fine," and our safety, our awareness of safety, starts to, and our awareness of danger starts to go down. And as this happens, we now open ourselves up, become victims. And these shows, in many cases, are designed to do this. They're designed to create victims. Why do you need? Why do these shows? want to create victims. Well, who else is going to go on the show? Once you start having psycho psychological problems and you start crying, you're great for, for Dr. Phil. Yeah, you've, you've, you've been raped, you've been molested. Hey, you're great. You're, you're now great TV viewing. You're now part of the science show. You can be brought on Dr. Phil. You can cry. You can weep. You can have your tears out there. And everybody is going to be empathetic with you. And 
you're going to share your issues. But what happens? Again, the false psychology is created. The false narrative is created. Uh, it looks like the problems have been resolved. This is what you see on TV. And the next person comes along, the next girl comes along, because there's primarily girls watching this, primarily girls watching this, feels, ah, oh, I'm in control of my life, and they'll go out and do the exact same thing the person was talking about on the air, talking about their feelings, on what happened, on the, on the, on the rape. And they don't talk about all their feelings. They talk about some of the feelings. They, talk, they bring rape out as an issue of power and control, that men want to be dominant, that this is an issue for men that they want to dominate the woman, and that this is a, a, uh, a rights issue. That women have the right to dress wherever the, the way they want, they have the right to walk wherever they want, and it's presented as a rights issue. It's not, issue, it's not presented as an issue of morality. And this is where the false narrative comes in, because this is if it's, if it's an issue of rights, if it's an issue of assertiveness, then the rape wouldn't have occurred in the first place, because the, these girls who went in these situations had the assertiveness training, they had this independence, they had this sense of independence. It was taken from them during the rape. And the rape isn't about power. And this is where girls don't understand guys. Rape has nothing to do with power. It's about sex. And that's all it's about. If they can get girls to believe that they're being empowered by going into these situations, the better for the guy. Because they're easier bait. They're easier to score. They're easier, easier to capture. They're easier to manipulate. And what happens as the girls become easier and easier to manipulate, because this is what's going on on their TV shows. They're being manipulated in their TV shows with an Oprah and pop psychology. They become easier and easier targets, and this is why you see what's happening now. You ask the question, well, how do you get to the point with all this, these years of feminism? How do you have uh, people walking around, girls walking around in bathing suits that are essentially band-aids? Well, simple, because they've been victimized. And these people have been victimized because they've been told, you're not a victim, you're standing up for your rights, you're being an assertive woman. And the guys are loving this. Because there's never been so great of an opportunity for them, ever. Because at the same time, the girls will turn around, well, he's a Neanderthal, he's an ape. That will go, great, I'm a Neanderthal, I'm an ape. I have my man cave. That means I can go out and rape whoever I want to rape. Because why? I'm a Neanderthal, I'm an animal, I'm not responsible for what I do. The narrative is created. The narrative is set. And now you have people who will continuously line up for TV... You have sob stories, you have these different things, the drama, that will sell newspapers, that will get people to watch TV, that fills these shows. This is Oprah, this is Tyra Banks, this is Dr. Phil, this is uh, The View, and all these other shows that are on during the daytime, which are basically soap operas. Your psychology, your soap operas dressed up as psychology. That's pop psychology. This fuels all this. This provides the material. This brings in the money. And so what do you, what, what do you say about this? What, how do you, you know, other than realizing that this is something that's wrong, and we, we will get into more of the details. Of the, this is some, we're sort of introducing this stuff. There's a lot more here. In the next section, we'll talk about specifically what happened on Oprah that demonstrates this even further. When we come back, Oprah, pop psychologist. Welcome back. Uh, we're now uh, working on our third and final segment. And this is Oprah, pop psychologist. Oprah ha uh, was supposed to set a new standard for these TV shows. And she did. She was a pioneer. She uh, was the first black woman. She was celebrated for all this. And she's known for her philanthropy, if you will. Well, again, this can be questioned. I mean, you know, 
uh, is it philanthropy when you go to Africa to build schools in Africa and you have cameras in tow and use this in an entire PR and marketing campaign? Uh, is this a PR when instead of, you know, openly giving to uh, American schools and other schools of need, you pick and ch choose, cherry pick and choose schools you want to give to and don't want to give to. I mean, if you're supposed to be paying extra tax, if it's supposed to be a socialist narrative that everyone needs to have a share of the, of, of the pie, then why isn't she sharing equally? But again, this isn't questioned. Of course, for, nobody questions this because nobody questioned, questions Oprah. But the problem can be illustrated in, uh, in her book club of what's going on and where she is actually a false, this is pseudo-psychology, this is false psychology. Uh, and this has to do with uh, one of the uh, books that she promoted in her book club. She brought on this guy who, who, who talked about how he came from the streets and he wrote a book about his experience in the street and he became a bestseller. They brought him around to all the different uh, clubs and to different meetings and to different uh, dinner parties and so on and so forth. And he became an instant star. He presumably became an instant millionaire. He was part of the high society when he had started off you know, out on the streets. If you understand psychology, you understand real psychology, you would understand that a person who's living on the street has, has severe psychological and mental health issues. And a lot of these issues include, include things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And in both schizophrenia and bi bipolar disorder, there's a uh, component of hallucination and uh, fantasy. In other words, they live within a fantasy world, they live within a world that is not specifically real, it's an, it's an illusion. Understanding this, you would understand that when a person from the streets write the, writes the book, you would understand that a large chunk of the book would be fiction and not real. It's not that the person is lying about it, it's the person believes that this is what actually happened. I have done a bit of work on the streets of Toronto with homeless. And I've chatted, unlike most psychologists and researchers, rather than putting them on a couch and putting them under a microscope and sort of you know, probing them at the lab. Uh, my, my approach was different. You treat them as human beings, you treat them as people. And, you, and the way you do psychology is through observation and you can observe a person's behavior as you're, as you're talking to them, right? So. You go out, you sit down, talk with them, you invite them out for a cup of coffee, you know, at a local donut shop or whatever, and have a discussion. You talk about things. And it's, you, let the, you let them ramble, you let them talk about whatever they want to talk about. As they begin their discussion, they first are a little hesitant about things, and, they, and the, ch the chit chat is general. As they come, become more comfortable with you, they start opening up about their life and how they got what they got. and. Uh, you know, that they appreciate that you're sitting there talking to them. They, that one of the big issues for a lot of people in this field is that, well, yes, people do give them money, but what they really want is they want human contact. They want to have somebody to talk to. And they're appreciative of, well, you're sitting there having coffee with them. They're happy for that. They're happy that instead of just having someone toss a coin into their cup uh, and walk on by, they have someone says hello and someone now, someone's now sitting down and having coffee with them. And as they start becoming comfortable with that and start talking about their experiences, and this is about one person who, uh, one person I've met who's, I'll give you the, the, the details, not details, but sort of his discussion. And he talks about how, you know, he says he doesn't understand why every time he goes to work and tries to get a job and hold down a job, that these aliens come in and start shooting laser beams at his head. And he's talking about, the, about this in a very normal tone, tone of voice. It's not as if he's imagining this. This is real to him. These are his experiences. And yet, you and I know this is, doesn't exist. When you read, sit down and read the book that was presented to Oprah as real, the same type of fiction pops up in there. You recognize the mental illness right away. Oprah didn't recognize it. Not at all. 
they, people started saying this book isn't real, this book is fiction. And when Oprah sat back and started looking at the book more carefully, she began to realize this. Her reaction wasn't, oh, this is part of the mental illness. The reaction was, oh, he's lying. And they turned him into, and Oprah, on air, turned him into a pariah. And not even Dr. Dr. Phil didn't say anything. Why? Because he didn't recognize the mental, mental illness, the real mental illness in this person. In other words, they took a mentally ill pill person off the street, created an, a false image of the person, and when the false image fell apart, they blamed the person. They blamed the victim. And if you know anything about bipolar disorder, if you know anything about uh, the hallucinations of schizophrenia, you know that d destroying these hallucinations without the proper, uh, without dealing with their, with their issues is a recipe for suicide. This is how a, bi a bipolar person commits suicide. If you look at what's going on, if you look at the suicide of uh, Robin Williams, Ron Williams had a bipolar person, uh, a bipolar disorder. He was bipolar. You could see that he was bipolar. And if you understand the psychology of bipolarism, the uh, the bipolar disorder, you know that, that that suicide does not occur on the low, when the person is down in in the in in the black mood. It occurs at the peak of their up mood. So what happens, the person, is, when they swing from bipolar, they'll go from a low and they'll go to an extreme high. They become very hyper. And this is where they have all their ideas. And at the peak of their, of their hyperactivity, the peak of their bipolar swing, this is where the bubble is burst. It collapses on them. And they go sharply down. It's a, it's a drop of a cliff. They go sharply down. To the low. It's in this drop from the high to the low, this is where the suicides occur. And this is why, you know, Robin Williams, he was at the top. He was doing well. He, he was back again. Things had started turning around for him. He was at the high. When he committed suicide, that's what was happening. He was at the high and he began to see things collapsing. He saw his world collapsing around him. This is what he thought. This is the psychology of bipolarism. It doesn't necessarily mean the world is collapsing around. It just you see it as that. This is your illusion, the thing that you create from yourself. The illusion that you create yourself begins to burst. As the illusion begins to burst, this is where the, you have the potential, the real potential of committing suicide. And this is what happened to Robin Williams. And this is exactly what they did to the person who wrote the book, the bipolar person who wrote the book from the streets. This person had probably had a, it did have a bi, bipolar disorder. They destroyed his fantasy, they destroyed his illusion, and they humiliated, humiliated him on the air. This is a recipe, this is, if you are a suicide person who does suicide prevention, who manages these phones on these hotlines, this is something you're told not to do, because you're going to guarantee that the person is going to commit suicide. And yet, we see on Oprah, and all the media around them, including Dr. Phil, destroying this person, destroying this mentally ill person. Nobody has turned around and said, hey, wait a minute here. This person is mentally ill. As a psychologist, as a, a, you claim to be a person who's humane, this is what your show is about. You're trying to heal these people. You're trying to help them, not destroy them. You know, this is exactly what you see in Oprah. Oprah's destroying this mentally ill person. And this is where you start seeing this whole thing of textbook psychology, of pop psychology, as being false, as being a pseudo-psychology. And this is what girls need to be aware of, that a lot of the stuff that's being presented to them is not real. And this is why you need to start, need, need to start peeling back, start looking beneath the covers and asking yourself, am I being told, am, is what I'm being told right or wrong? Am I being lied to? And people will sit there and lie to you with a very straight face, particularly if it means money for them. If they're making a lot of money, if Oprah's making billions of dollars, she's not going to risk her money to help somebody who's poor. 
She's not going to risk her entire... And this was to do with the school. She didn't risk her entire money, her entire fortune on the school. She took a tiny portion of it, less than 10%, and started the school. And if, if you follow what happened to the school, there's abuse there. There's a, It fell apart. And this is why it's not in the news. It was an initial thing. It brought her in lots of money, lots of attention, a lot of ratings, and then it dropped and died. And this is the face of Oprah, this is the face of Dr. Phil, this is the face of pop psychology, and this is the face of what's going on within the girls. This, this, is, what, this is where we come from, from IMO. IMO is the exact same thing. It's a five-minute version of Dr. Phil and Oprah. And this is where the need is to sort of start, start peeling back a And this is what IMO Vlog does. IMO takes the superficial five-minute uh, 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 pop psychology session and peels back the layer, trying to get a better understanding, trying to get, bring about a better understanding of what's really going on. And the, I said, this is how you've seen now, how it connects back to slut shaming, how it connects back to the sex scandals of, on YouTube, which are, I don't call them sex scandals, they're rape. Rape is rape. You, there's no way to say, oh, well, it's really a sex, no, it's not a sex, it's not a sex, it's not a sex scandal, it's rape. And if you really want to start dealing with something, you want to make a difference, then you have to recognize what it is. And unfortunately, for the Geeky Blonde and a lot of these other people who talked about these uh, the issues on, on YouTube, they avoided the issue. They don't really deal with the actual issue of rape within their discussion. And so what happens, the narrative becomes fine now for uh, YouTube Go, oh, well, yeah, we made a mistake. They issued an apology, but things go on exactly the same. In other words, what happened, the geeky blonde, she was shut up. She was, you know, she made her complaints. Uh, and they, what they did, they gave her a booth and, and some pamphlets. And they put, and they had her there at one of the cons giving out pamphlets about rape. That doesn't solve the problem. It, it, the problem isn't, isn't, isn't about handing out pamphlets. That's not how you solve the problem. You need to be aware of what's at, what causes the situation, how the situation evolves, and once you understand how the situation evolves, you understand the psychology, then you can start bringing in some real solutions. And until you do that, there aren't any real solutions there. These, are, these solutions are pseudo-solutions. They're pseudo-psychology. They're pop psychology. They're, 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 they're meat and feed for the popular television circuit. They're, they're things you go on Oprah and Dr. Phil and cry about. They're things of interviews. But they do not provide real solutions and the problem continues on after again and again and again. Because the reality is not understood. And it was never even looked at. Anyways, uh, that's it for uh, this edition, for the uh, 48th edition of uh, 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 Week 48 uh, on IMO Vlogs. Uh, we'll be back shortly, uh, within a couple days, with uh, week 49. Uh, we are getting caught up on our filming, so uh, look for these shows to come out on a more regular basis. And this is, this is not going to be short. These are continued week after week, and bit by bit we're going to peel back the layers and look at things more in-depth. And again, in-depth in depth is not five minutes. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, uh, see you uh, in the next episode. All right. Take it easy and goodbye. Democratic, Democratic Earth. Earth.